one two one two welcome to the revolution of one live stream this is tk coleman and today i've got the holy trifecta my guest coach williams is a, is is a teacher he's a business owner and he is a motivator now usually when you see any of these things you see them in, in isolation you've got a lot of motivators out there who may not really have any experience with building a business or you may have a lot of business owners out there who may not really be that experienced or interested in motivating other people. Or you might have teachers out there who don't do either of those things really. you know. Um, but my guest today brings the complete package all together and I'm really excited to talk with him about lessons he has learned about building things from his business experience. Um, what kinds of questions the schools are asking, the people are wrestling with as he works as a performance coach and, uh, and why economics matters to him so much to want to be able to spread the word about things like financial literacy, economic self-sufficiency, wealth, and so forth. So, Coach Williams, welcome to the live stream. I appreciate you joining us today. Man, thank you guys for having me. This is more than exciting to be in you guys' presence. You're talking about the trifecta, but to be in the presence of a TK Coleman and be in the presence of a Kamau, that I taught in 12th grade at the Benjamin Elijah Mays High School in Atlanta, Georgia. Man, it is an honor whenever you have a student that comes back and you see how he's growing and what he's doing. So, you know, I'm all smiles right now. Hey, Coach, give me your funniest Kamal story before before we get started. All right, what's so your favorite had, Kamal story? Oh, man, here, here we go. I was ready for that. We had a, a, a boy uh, empowerment group called Be My ben, Benjamin Elijah Men of Business. And I wanted to teach these guys from a young age about leadership because I think a lot of times, man, we, uh, a lot of times in our communities, we are so focused on the strugglers, the people that are struggling, that we don't give a lot of attention and time to the kids that are really doing well. And Kamal was in that 10 or 12% that was really, really doing well. So I wanted to take those guys on our wing under my wing and let's roll to doing good to becoming great. But part of being in the group, you had to step, you know, so Kamal had to step a little bit. And I never forget, we had a, a little uh, thing in the, we entertained a basketball game at, at halftime and kept Kamal went out there with some of the guys, all the guys were smart, 3.5 GPAs and up and all that. Kamal went out there and man uh, attempted to dance. And when I tell you, uh, we got to work on that rhythm back in the day. You know what I'm saying? He, he can smile and charm the girls, man. But when it came to that dancing, I promise you, Kamal always was the last one to learn how to get a dance step. But uh, just watch him come out there, dance, and be in a in a presence to say, you know what, man, I can't dance the heck with it and just do his thing and, you know, just be corny in dancing. But he was corny in dancing. But that's my guy, Kamal. Hey, look, 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 come out. Before we, we, we turn this into a roast, that wasn't my role. My role was not the dancer. My my line name was the ultimate fantasy. I was there for one reason and one reason only. It was for looks. It was it was to make sure that the crowd was inspired, compelled, and that we grabbed the chip. Hey, 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 I guess uh I guess if you ever have a moment like that, you could always change the narrative to, I was there for the comedy. <laughs> he was just there to bring the comedy, that's all. <laughs> exactly, he, he who holds the pen writes the story. And we know how history has been, so you, you already know. He who has the pen writes the story. <laughs> well, Coach, you know, we, we have a long history and I'd say a, a lot of the reason that I was interested in working at the Foundation for Economic Education is because of your class senior year, is because of some of the things that you talked about. Um, you were one of the most what, like renowned coaches that worked at Benjamin E. Mays and, and, and taught a lot of the students um, who came from the community of Southwest Atlanta. You had an impact on a lot of people, not people just in my class, but classes, you know, five years before me, and I'm sure years after me. And so I'd like you to kind of walk us through, why did you get into coaching in the first place? I, I, or uh, teaching in the first place? I know you've always kind of been entrepreneurial. 
You've always had a mind for business. In college, you studied economics. So why teaching? Why was that your first move? Well, one thing that I, I learned, Kamal, was that people need to really die, you know, invest in their gifts. So I knew from an early age that my gift was inspiring other people. You know what I'm saying? And giving other people the tools that they needed to be successful. So to me, when you follow your gifts and you uh, use those gifts to help someone, you are creating your purpose. So my purpose was to pour into you guys, all the people that I have touched and I have coached and I have taught, because my whole thing is if I can make someone better, if I can reach across that wall and give the symbolism to the picture that he's not heavy, he's my brother. That's what I've always been about. And every day that I was in the classroom for 15 years, I never worked a day in my life because that was my purpose. And people got to understand the difference between their career and their job. My career was that of education, which means that I could be fired from that at any time in my life. But my job was my purpose, and that is inspiring others to be better. So they can take my career, but people can never take my job. That's why I say I never worked a day in my life, man, because when I see you and other guys like yourself come back and you're doing what we talked about, you know, some 10 years ago, reaching back and picking up that other person and saying that they're not heavy, that's what it's all about to me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you, you, you know, you talked about inspiring and and how that that's something that was a gift of yours from an early age where i know we're going to touch on this a little bit later but can you kind of give us a preview of you know how do you how do you embrace this gift of being a motivator now what does this look like in your day-to-day -day work it, what it looks like man is uh with my day-to-day -day work i'm in the instructional leadership coordinator for atlanta public schools long title all that really means is that I have the opportunity to work with and train the uh, school leadership teams, which will include the principal, assistant principal, instructional coaches, uh, and all those people that work with the leadership team because they need training too. So I changed my title to a certain degree into saying that I am a performance coach. Performance coach means to me that you go beyond the instructional side. Of it. You get to know people, you build relationships, and you find out what is the gap between what they're not doing well and what they need to do to perform that much better. So that's my job. I'm a gap filler. You know, I look at people, I evaluate people, I observe people, and it's just not about do they understand history? Do they understand ELA? Because that might not be the gap of the reason why they're not performing well. It might be something very personal or something that that's going on in their life that they're not seeing. It might be an attitude issue that they're having that I'll come in and we'll sit down and do a SWOT analysis and what you know I'll have in feedback to them might not have anything to do with content. It might have to do with, hey, hey bro, have you ever considered changing the way that you speak to people? Have you ever considered a why? Why do you think you're reacting the way that you're reacting? So that's my job. That's kind of what I do in Atlanta Public Schools is, you know, work on the behalf of being like a performance coach. I'm there to ensure people are performing at their optimal level. Coach, what's, what's one of your, your favorite stories about maybe how, how you were able to help somebody perform better by addressing like an indirect issue that wasn't even about what's happening in the classroom? Well, you know, uh, I used to work at Westlake High School, funny story. And one of my students that was in Westlake High School was uh, Cameron Newton. Uh, and Cam was in my economics class. And this is the crazy thing. Cam was always a great kid, man. Great kid and had great grades. You know, a lot of people, you know, think athletes don't have a Cam was a very, very good student. He was a little mischievous and Cam was, and when I say mischievous, I don't think Cam was challenged educationally a lot because he had time to always do little witty things in the classroom. So one day I told Cam the story of Superman, and I think I told Kamal them the story as well. And I'll make it quick, because I can get long-winded, I'm from Mississippi. So uh, the whole point is that Superman is from a planet called Krypton, right? But this is the beautiful thing. On Krypton, everybody's Superman, everybody wears a cape. So that's not a costume. 
So when Superman was sent to uh, to Earth, you know, his parents found him and they wanted to put him in a disguise because they felt like if anybody knew the powers that Superman had, that they would take him and destroy him. So sometimes as parents, instead of embracing who our kids are and propelling them to be who they're supposed to be in life, we are the ones that shield and hide our, our kids from greatness. So that's not that's the rule number one. If you're a parent, you're there to expose your kids to greatness, not hide. Them. So Superman technically, you know, was told you need to pick a disguise. His disguise was that of Clark Kent. Now, this is crazy because Clark Kent, the disguise he took was that of a stumbling, bumbling fool. So this is what Superman thought about all human beings that they were stumbling, bumbling fools, and I can disguise myself into that, and nobody will know that I'm Superman. Well, the whole point of the story is this. Superman wears the cape, he wears the, the tights and everything, but that's what makes him different than everybody else, that you can't be afraid to stand out and be who you are. Yeah, everybody's gonna look at you because you got that S across your chest that stands for hope, but you are put on that pedestal because sometimes you are put there to be the one, the one, you guys saw my revolution of one, the one that's going to lead the masses. Well, the, the, the thing with Cam Newton, when I told him this story, I was like, Cam, you got to understand, you can't be afraid to be Superman. Stop being Clark Kent. Clark Kent is the stumbling, bumbling fool that's literally trying to disguise himself as everybody else so he won't stand out as being great. Son, you are great. So, you know, it just took me that when Cam got to Auburn and played football there, one of the things that he would always do when he scored a touchdown was open up that chest to let everybody know, I am the great hope, because that's what that S stands for. And I always took that as Cam deciding to be Superman instead of being Clark Kent. He wanted people to understand it wasn't about him showboating. But I'm not afraid to be a leader. I'm not afraid to take this thing to the next level. And I choose to be Clark. I choose to be Superman instead of Clark Kent. So that's that story, man. I love that story about him. Okay, I, I got to get one way in, one follow up to that. That was such an excellent story, Coach. One of the things that gets pushed back a lot today is when 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 you espouse a message where you're you're reminding people of how great they are. You're speaking to the part of people that says, you are brilliant, you are beautiful, embrace that. That often gets lumped into the same category as like, um, you know, um, helping create an entitlement mindset that you deserve everything just because you have high self-esteem and you feel good about yourself, right? And we know that in order to be successful, you gotta do more than just walk into the room and be like, hey, I, I deserve a great life. You actually got to put in the work. And, and I imagine what separates Cam Newton from a lot of people with high self-esteem is that he could actually back it up. So my question for you is, how do you preach a philosophy where you remind people of their greatness while still making sure you challenge them to earn you know, the success that they seek? How, how do you find that balance? And, and, and that's a great question, man. Uh, one of the things that it's, it's about the expectation as a mentor, as a leader, as a father that you take, you know, with your kids or whoever that you're teaching. My expectation, and Kamal can tell you, the first day when kids walk into my classroom, I would tell them I'm 97% perfect. I'm 97% perfect, but I want you to be better than me. So the expectation is that we are always going to strive for perfection. We are striving for perfection. Every day is a day that we are here to get better. We don't strive to be mediocre. We don't accept mediocrity and we're striving to get better. And once you start taking uh, young men and women, you know, regardless of color, but young women at Benjamin E. Mays, it was mostly 98% African-American. Once you start preaching at two kids like that, they start developing and understanding their self-worth. It's not saying that, hey, I'm better than anybody else, but I'm understanding what is my value? What do I bring to the table? You know, uh, it's a thing that I talk about that when you bring something to the uh, to the table, people will make space for you. You know, you develop, you create your own value and you do that and you still have the sense in mind to be humble, to work hard because your value become your value comes because you're going to say to everybody else in this circle, 
I'm going to outwork you. I'm going to be better. You know, I'm going to do the things to spend the time that you don't want to spend. I'm going to do that. And I and when I'm able before I go to bed tonight at night to look myself in, in the mirror and ask that question, did you do all the things that are going to be significant? And did you do and perform all the things? Did you cheat yourself? And if you're able to walk away from that conversation with you and say, I did everything that I was supposed to do in this scenario, that's when you understand that I am valuable, that I'm supposed to be at the party. I don't have to sit around and wait on somebody to give me an invitation. They're going to inv invite me because they value what I bring to this party. You know, what it makes me think about is when you're having conversations with someone and you're telling them all these expectations and all these goals that you have and all these things that you want to do and people kind of try to calm you down, like try to taper you down from it and say, look, you're always going to be your worst critic. Don't be too hard on yourself. Don't beat yourself up. But for me, the way that I am, the way that I look at being my worst critic isn't a bad thing. I don't think anybody else is going to have the same expectations, the same goals, the same vision, you know, the same uh, expectation of excellence that I will have for myself. And I often, you know, take people's advice in those situations with, with a grain of salt. Like, I know you mean well, but it's really easy to uh, allow other people to take down the expectations that you should have for yourself. You should strive to push yourself as hard and as far as, as you know, as you possibly know that you can, you can take. I think you're, you're going to be the person who knows what is, you know, what am I capable of? And in addition to that, you know, how far can I push myself without going over the edge? Nobody's going to know that. You're, you're going to be able to keep the pulse on that. And I think a lot of times people allow, you know, this notion of you're your worst critic to, to, to stop them from pushing themselves to, to rise to the occasion, to, to, to stop them from becoming the Superman that, you know, is really uh, true to their DNA and to their character. Without a doubt, uh, Kamal, and you know, to be honest, you were a student that I think understood that uh, a lot quicker than students your age, that it was okay to be come out. You didn't have to try to be anybody else. And regardless of what other people said to you, and this is where we get in trouble a lot because, you know, we will allow other people to write our, to write our narratives. And we just talked about that. You are the author of your own narrative, man. Nobody knows what you're trying to pursue and do better than yourself. So don't allow somebody else to come and tell you, no, nah, I think you ought to be doing this. No, nah, you can't write my narrative. You know, I have to pin for that. Let me put a dot on my own sentence. You know, and I think a lot of us just get overwhelmed with making decisions. And then we get to the point where we don't want to make decisions anymore. Well, that's not leadership. Leaders make decisions. And some you're going to have to make the tough decisions sometimes and the toughest decisions that you will ever make will be about yourself and what you're trying to prove and do for yourself. Mm -hmm. CK, you look like you're pondering over there. Did that one speak to you? Yeah, that one really spoke to me, man. Um, especially when I juxtapose it with, with your point about how, you know, <clears throat> you got to take other people's advice with a grain of salt because a lot of times the advice that's given to you, it's it's a mixture of a couple of different things. On, on one side, it's a mixture of, of what this person genuinely thinks is maybe the best thing that they can say to you. But it's also a reflection of, of what they think you can handle, right? Because th there are always these little, there are always these little nuggets for success that we may hold back on because it's the kind of thing that you got to find out for yourself, right? Um, where you got to be willing to take responsibility for the results that you get. And so whenever people give advice, a lot of times there's kind of a consciousness of liability that's involved in that advice. And so there are certain things about success that people just can't tell you. They just can't because these are the types of things that you've got to find out on your own, right? Like I, I'm not going to be the guy to tell you like, Hey, 
completely disregard anything that anybody says and go out there and make that risky investment because high risk, high return, baby. I'm not going to be that guy, right? Like right. you got to come to that conclusion on your own because if, if, if you do it because I said it, then you go out there and make that high risk investment and lose all your money. Who are you going to want to talk to? You're going to want to talk to me. Who are you going to want to blame that on? You know, um, and so being a leader involves looking beyond what leaders are even capable of telling you or willing to tell you and deciding what do you want to lead? How do you want to lead yourself and how do you want to take ownership of, 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 of what you're telling yourself? You know, it is that it's the, it's the ownership part that really gets us in trouble. Uh, and you'll start seeing you guys, you know, you're in the business, you, you, you've seen it, that a lot of people at the top are afraid to pull the trigger because they know it comes back to them. And when I say pull the trigger, make that decision, you know, who has to leave, who has to go? What do I need to do? People want to be able to deflect their, their responsibility onto others and say, you know what? I messed that up because you told me such and such. But, you know, Kamal can tell you what's the what's the little saying, uh, the little quote, Kamal, that we used to talk about in class. Every man has his own courage. You know, talk to me about read that to me, bro, because I know you got it. You still got it. So what, what did what did it say? What did we talk about? Yeah, yeah. It, it's by Ralph Waldo Emerson. And it says every man has his own courage and is betrayed because he seeks in himself the courage of other persons. Yeah. You know, every man has his own courage, but the whole point of that, what, uh, uh, what he's talking about is, you know, for yourself, if it's good, if it's not good, but instead of taking that responsibility and being courageous and say, Hey, I'm going to be Superman. I'm going to let this cape blow in the wind and I'm going to make this decision. We'll turn around and say, Hey man, what you think? You know, I, I see people on Facebook every day doing their business and they're in the process of creating their vision. And they're asking other people to create their vision for them. You know, hey, what do you guys think about, you know, me creating this logo? What do you guys think about, hey, man, it's your vision. How are you asking somebody else to create your vision? You know, so now when it's time to walk, walk that road, you know, you talk about, man, I didn't see that road right there. I didn't see that road. Yeah, all those streets were created because you allowed somebody else to implant their vision in what you wanted to do. So it's not your vision anymore. <laughs> you know, you let somebody hijack your vision. And that's what we do all the time. And then we end up at 45, 50 years old talking about we blaming mom and dad because we didn't do and execute the vision that we had and say it was mom and dad's fault. You know, so that's, I ain't gonna go down that road, you know, but. <laughs> Hey, hey, but coach, that's it. To, to me, I think that's what regret is. Regret isn't getting to a point in life where you failed. I, I believe if you fail in the right way, you can embrace that failure and learn from it. And, and we all have instances of that where we tried things, it didn't go the way we expected it. And we say, hey, you know what? I'm glad I tried it because how else was I going to find out for myself? But I think that the heart of regret is when you fail and you get to that moment and you say, I should have did what I wanted to do. And, mm -hmm. and you realize that, that, that you didn't have the right kind of failure. You didn't fail at trying the thing that you actually believed in. You failed at some watered down, uninteresting version that you were never even passionate about, but you did it because that's what somebody else said you should do or you have to do. That to me is what regret is. And you know what, man, TK, one of the biggest things that you will get an argument when people get into really conversations with me is that we've argued the most about is this thought of having a backup plan. We tell kids, hey, you know, I know that you want to be a doctor. I know that you want to be whatever, but this is your backup plan. You just gave that kid the opportunity to go and not do it. You know what I'm saying? Now he ain't 100 percent bought in that he can do this. He's always thinking that, well, if I don't, if I don't, I can always, you know, fall back on. There's no such thing as fall back. You know what I'm saying? You you do. If I would have had that mentality from the jump, but because of the families, you know, in the, the, the environment that I came from, where a lot of times, you know, I wanted to take risks. But at that time, I wasn't living the quote that Kamal just said. I was allowing other people's interpretation of my value. 
to be placed on me. I didn't jump out there because somebody else said, man, what you going to do with that? What you going to And that was all I needed to say, nope, not going to jump out there. But when you put that value in yourself and you say, hey, I'm going to jump out there 100 percent. And it ain't no. That's why, you know, rappers and stuff have they make it to where there's uh, they're going all the time because they got that grind mentality. Their boss, I'm going to be in the studio. And while y'all sitting around here looking at your girlfriend, having a staring contest with her, I'm in the studio grinding and I'm going to get it because this is it. It's all or nothing. When you got that rock bottom all or nothing, I got to make it work. You make it work. That's why I tell people sometimes the worst thing that can happen to young folks is they get a job because when they get a job, they get comfortable and they start living out somebody else's dream instead of really exploring what they really wanted to do. What was their purpose? What was their gift? And your gift plus your, you know, your gift and helping other people with your gift creates your purpose. So that's that's the whole point of that, man. You know, I know oh, Kamal will recognize me. I know Kamal's going to recognize this. You know, I was I was having a conversation with someone recently where I was talking that kind of talk. And he was like, that's terrible advice. You know, that's like dangerous. That's like a dangerous idea. And I think a lot of people get uncomfortable with this idea. Who was it? Will Smith who said the best plan A is to not have a plan B, right? And people who are successful know that there's something to that. But that frightens people. And it frightens people yeah. because most people approach that idea with a lack of imagination. They they see it as a naive belief that if you go all in on something, you're guaranteed to succeed. And that's not what it's about at all. It, it's, it's about understanding that when you go all in on something, you have a higher probability of success. But even if you don't, instead of going back to a backup plan, go forward with the things you have learned as a result of following your dream and then create something that doesn't already exist. And you are never right. more empowered to do that then when you try the things that you really want to try, I've gone all in on a lot of dreams that have flat out failed, but the way that those dreams transformed me, the lessons that I learned about business, about life, about creativity as a result of it, I never wanted to go to that backup plan. There was no point. Like I was, I was way more valuable than the person who cared about the backup plan. I wanted to create something new and different that I couldn't have even thought about back when I was just conceiving the dream. And, and, and I think that's, I think people miss that. That's the crucial part. It's not a naive philosophy that says, oh, just go all in and the universe will magically allow all your expectations to come true. It's like, no, go all in because that's the best chance of succeeding. And if you don't succeed, going all in is the best chance of coming up with something else that's actually worth doing. That's growth mindset, man. That, that's the premise of growth mindset. It doesn't mean growth mindset that I'm going to go all in and if I fail, it's over. The point is you're going to fail. You are going to fail. The, the thing is, you know, when I talk to people about uh, this theory that I read about is the E plus R equals O theory, uh, you know, and basically what it's basically saying with E plus R equals O is that you're going to have events. So events plus the way that you respond to the event equals the outcome. I can't control events, but I can control the way I respond to the event, which is ultimately going to create my outcome. So when people are having terrible outcomes, they need to go back and look at the R and say, how am I responding to events that I can't control? Because if I wanna change the outcome, I got now that means I gotta change something about me. I got to change the way I respond to the event. I can't prevent COVID, but I can change the outcome or change my response to a lot of the things that COVID has done that's going to create different outcomes for me. And I had to learn that. And I think that's very important for all of us to learn that too many people try to control the event. They try to control the E, which is messing up their R. They're having negative responses, which is creating the O, terrible outcomes. So if you want to change your outcome, change the way that you're responding to the event. Hmm. Cool. Coach, something that that is coming to mind, you know, I, I think a lot of people in this audience um, who follow the revolution one would consider themselves entrepreneurial. And I think, I think the point that you brought up about 
not having a plan B. It's, it's scary for a lot of people. And I, and I think the thing that usually motivates is testimonies, is success stories, is hearing other people who are like them, who aren't smarter, who aren't better, who aren't, who aren't, who aren't born with, with just these, you know, super, superpower, superhuman, um, you know, gifts that, that regular people can make that transition. So I wanted to kind of shift it to you and, and, and ask you to talk to our audience about, you know, what was that shift like to you? You know, what was jumping off the porch like to you? And what are some of the lessons you learned from it? Yeah, jumping off the porch for me, man, started uh, back in college. You know, I had the opportunity back in college. I was in a fraternity. I still am, you know, to to run a club, you know, that that was on Thursday nights and everything. And just the whole mindset of being a business owner was kind of developed right then. You know, I always wanted to be able to control the narrative to a certain degree or control the way I could respond to a narrative. You know, so doing that and then when I moved to Atlanta with a couple of my uh, frat brothers, one of the things that I was really, really talented with and good was cooking. You know, my mom was a great cook. You know, uh, my dad wasn't. He used to burn the barbecue all the time because his mind, that wasn't his that wasn't his gift. You know, so my gift was being patient with that. And I used to hear people all the time, Shannon, man, your, your barbecue really tastes, it tastes good, man. It, it's consistent. It's the same taste every time. You know, it, it's literally like the same thing every time. And as my name grew out there and when I got married and uh, my wife, Kalila Hicks Williams, who is from Tampa, Florida, you know, one of the big things uh, was going to Tampa. And this was the this is when I knew I could cook for a bunch of people. Uh, so we're in the first year of our marriage. I go to meet all of her family down in Tampa and they assigned me to be the one to be the to, to be the grill master for the family uh, get together. And uh, you talking about over 50, 60 people in the park, man. And I, I, I threw down the grill, the, the, the ribs, the beans, the chicken, everything was on point. Everybody came back. And you know how that is now. When you marry into a family of people that can cook, when they come back and give you compliments, and you know, I can never forget uh, my wife's uncle, Uncle Kurt, came to me and said, hey boy, you all right, you all right. I'm gonna try to find you some spots down here in Tampa, man, that you can cook at, you all right. And when I got that blessing from Uncle Kurt that you know you might need to look at opening up your own uh, barbecue business, I took that to heart and I created Fat Daddy Smoking Barbecue, and that's kind of how it started. Mm -hmm. We had a guest who came on a couple episodes who, who talked about finding their purpose, finding their why. And, and his premise was that a lot of times we just overlook it. A lot of times things that, you know, things that we're good at or things that we take for granted. The best way to kind of tap into your purpose is is when other people look at you and they notice and they tell you, like, that's not normal. You're doing something remarkable. Like, this, that's not something that the rest of us can do. And, and that's special. And I think, again, it, it's easy to take that for granted. It's easy to look past that and be like, you know, there's nothing impressive about that. Yeah, I can cook a few beans, a few ribs. But it's really when you get that, that confirmation, you know, some could say that market confirmation, but I think just confirmation from, from an audience who, who is similar to the folks, you know, that you would serve in business, that, that's everything. And I think too often we overlook our talents um, and, and don't and, 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 and kind of sell ourselves short of our abilities. Man, Kamal, I, you know, when I was speaking to a, uh, a ninth grade class at Thero High School, one of the things I talked to them about is, of course, understanding your gifts and knowing what you've been blessed with, you've been gifted with. And once you understand your gift, stay in that lane. You know, there's a lot of times why you have people that are entertainers and you have people that are writers, you know, and a lot of times the confusion happens when the writer who is a gifted songwriter try, starts trying to do what? Entertain. It don't look right. It ain't natural. And then when that songwriter starts, I mean, that entertainer, that's a dancer, that's just an entertainer, a lot of times starts trying to write their own music. It flops. So you have to really stay in the lane of what your gift is and understand your gift and be who what that gift has called you to be. 
you know, I think a lot of times with, with some of us, we're so busy trying to imitate and be who what other people said they think we should be that we never get our opportunity to figure out what our gifts. And let me just say this, your gift is inherent, which means that it's already there. You know, people tell the story, hey man, you need to go find your gift. You gotta go find your gift. Universe, you was birthed with your gift. You was birthed mm -hmm. with your gift. Your gift is already there. So all you have to do is tap into that gift. And that's what happens. We got a lot of people that go to the cemetery and the cemetery is the richest place in the world because they went to the cemetery with their gift. The gift is based on when are you going to tap into it? And the biggest thing come out when you have that gift, you're supposed to do what? Give it away. So that's why we, I call, I call them, you know, thieves. I call them generational thieves because we got people that's going to the cemetery that never had an opportunity to tap in their gift and never do the biggest thing that you're supposed to do with a gift is give it away to the next generation. And therefore we have people that's under us that's coming up that don't understand what the premise of gift giving really is because they never found theirs and they're never going to give it to the next generation. And that's how we lose out as people because we have generational gaps. Yep. That's such a deep concept. Another, I, go ahead, TK. It's all good, man. Go ahead. You got it. I was saying that it's just such a deep concept that that the people who don't tap into their gifts, um, that, that that passes on. That mindset, that fear passes on. You know, it, I, I don't think a lot of us can can relate to the notion of, of a family member or of a parent saying, look, you got to go for it. There's no plan B. A lot of parents want you to play it safe. They, they, they want you to go the route of least resistance. They, they don't want to see you, you, you know, you fail. Um, and I think not only parents, but but just people around you, you know, friends, loved ones, people who care about you all too often. You know, they don't they don't want life to be hard for you. You know, they, they don't want you to go to, through the struggle. And I think a lot of people just miss the fact that that's a part of the process and that the people who haven't gone through the process will never be able to speak to the process. They haven't been through it. A, a great piece of advice I, I heard uh, fairly early on was, you know, follow those who have walked through the valleys and have made it to the top of the mountain. You know, anybody at the bottom of the valley can, you know, imagine and story tell about what the mountaintop looks like. But until you've climbed it, you, you know, you won't know. And it'll just be here or there. It'll just be, you know, stories. And I think it's just critical to surround yourselves because they're usually not gonna come as default, but to surround yourselves with people who've walked to that mountaintop, who've walked through the process um, and who've been through the valleys and the peaks. Yeah. Um, we'll use this term, man. Here's the term. We still, and we're always teaching. We're always teaching. We're in class right now. You know, the term I use for that, Kamal and TK, is called productive discomfort. Productive discomfort. Whenever you're in a situation where you're trying to learn and you're not surrounded by productive discomfort and it's coming too easy, you're not learning. You know, let me put this into another type of scenario. Kamal, and we won't name any names, but if we go back to all of our high school, college, if we went to college, or whatever situation, the classes where we were challenged the most is where we learned the most. The classes where we felt the most uncomfortable a lot of times because that teacher was really trying to pull that out of you, that productive discomfort, that teacher kind of stood on your toes a little bit. Those were the classes that we perform the best in and we learn the best in. Pressure isn't a bad thing. But if we look at that, those classes where it was a kickback, was no pressure, nothing was ever really going on. The teacher never made you, uh, never gave you the expectation that this information you gotta know, those were the classes that we didn't really get a lot out of. So you gotta have productive discomfort. Somebody has to stand on your toes to make you always feel like, I gotta move, I can't get comfortable. 
you know, this is not, I don't want to get too comfortable right here. I want to stay being productive. Me and Kamal talk about in, in microeconomics is being on that production possibility curve. What is going to make us do what? Go out. We don't want to go inside the curve because inside the curve, we're being inefficient. But if we keep on moving out, that means that we are producing more. So I want to always be outside of that production possibility curve where I'm producing more and more and more. The time when I start to go inside the curve, that means I'm not doing a good job. That means I've become too comfortable where I'm at and I never want to be too comfortable. You know, that, that's Coach. actually a perfect way. I wanted I wanted to talk about economics and, and, and you know, something we kind of previewed. You know, why economics? Why, why, why do our people need to understand that everything comes back to economics? And, yeah, and, and coach, to, before, as part of answering yeah, that, as part of answering that, can, can you give us your definition of what economics even is for those who are listening and they just associate it with, with finance? What is economics? I would say economics is learning how to um, fulfill the needs of scarce resources, man. What do we do every day to fulfill the needs of scarce resources? The questions, the decisions, the decisions that we make to fulfill the need of scarce resources. So in economics, any resource technically that you desire is either going to be a resource that is plentiful or a resource is scarce. So let me give you a quick lesson. So uh, Kamau is my son. And I send Kamal to the store with $20. I'm really giving him a lot of money today. So when Kamal gets to the store and he has $20, all everything that is available to be bought at the store becomes the opportunities that Kamal can spend his money on. But the problem is he only has $20. So this $20 now will force Kamal to make some economic decisions because he can't buy everything that he wants with that $20. So he has to make the difference between some trade-offs and some opportunity costs. So everything that Kamal decides not to buy at the mall that day becomes his trade-off. He traded it all to buy one thing. And the one thing that Kamal bought that day was a t-shirt. Now, Kamal wouldn't have bought that t-shirt. He would have went to Chick-fil-A and bought some food. That food became his opportunity cost, the next best thing that he would have bought if he wouldn't have bought the main thing. But this happens in life every day with everything that we do. We have to make trade-offs and opportunity costs based on the, the scarce resources or the resources that we are trying to attain in our lives. So that's the questions and the decisions that we make. So everything in life comes down to me, to economic decisions. Hmm. Now, following up with Kamal's question about that, why does economics matter for us? Like, why I is think, this something we should? Yeah. Yeah, TK, that's, that's a brilliant question, man, because I think a lot of times uh, we get caught up in stuff that really doesn't make a difference. You know, and I think that when we start looking at the economic ramifications, of what's happening in this country and the ec economic ramifications of what's happening. So let's look at, look at it from this standpoint. Every presidential year, the big push is to get, you know, get registered to vote. But we don't talk about the ramifications and the economics and how important it is to vote in the local elections, which will basically have more, you know, influence on your life. We talk about the national election because we don't talk about uh, if we're voting on how the taxes can be used. And the first thing that we'll do as a people is go out to the school system and raise sand and saying that we're not getting our fair share. But, you know, when we say, well, did you register to vote? Yeah, I voted for the president. It ain't got nothing to do with you voting. You know what I'm saying? If we're talking about the way that funds are used for public when we start talking about one of the things that republicans say all the time they're going to cut taxes but and i know i'm taking this around the way but i want us to understand when they say cut taxes they're really saying that they're going to cut the use of money for public goods 
You know, so when they say they're cutting taxes, that means they're about to cut the money that's used to operate some parks. They're about to cut the money that's used to operate some community centers. But we don't see that because we don't look at economics in that standpoint as being important. So when we say, well, you know, they're going to cut taxes, that's good for me. No, it ain't good for you if you're living in the city and your kid is going to that park and needs their recreation center or whatever. So that's why we got to look at the tech, you know, look at the economics of everything because it affects your life. You know, uh, people are based on if, if we was really true to ourselves about political parties. You based on your political party, you should be a lot of times based on your wallet, you know, and that's why when I say that, that's why in a lot of times now, you know, not all of them. I don't want to paint this whole side of the bar, but a lot of times Republicans are Republicans because of how much money they're trying to cut from the use of public goods that people that is not making a certain amount of money is using. And they're saying, well, I'm not sending my kid to that public park, so why should I use it? So why should I want it? Well, as we a lot of times, and I'm from Mississippi, I'm from a place where you have more people that are Republican, that are poor people, that vote against their own self, you know, thing that they need just to say that they're Republican. You know what I'm saying? And you know what the reason why a lot of them say but they're, they're Republican. But that's that's the whole point of why we need to understand the economics, because that really challenges us to see how we're living and why we do some of the things that we do. And we got to just stop doing it based off somebody telling us, well, you know, because I, I challenge come out in the class, go home and ask your parents why they are, what's their political affiliation and why they are what they are. You know, and a lot of times, TK, when they came back, come out, what was the answer? I'm, I'm a Democrat because of what? Skin tone. I'm a Democrat because of what? My granddaddy was one. I'm a Democrat or a Republican because of what? And we never associated the economic side of, hey, this is the way I take care of my household. This is the way my funds are going. And I want to support whatever way that's going to do my funds in the best way it's supposed to be done. And I think sometimes we get trapped into just following people just because they say they are this and that. And we don't consider how this person and what they're voting for is going to support the needs that I have to take care of my family. Long way to just you say know, it, Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it, it's, it's interesting uh, that when you look at it from a political angle, because I, I think e even at a meta level, be, you know, beyond, you know, which party or which side seems to seems to support my needs the most, there's kind of like a default assumption whenever people look at economic problems, there's kind of like a default assumption that the best solution to the problem is some kind of government policy. That, that That's kind of like the default, right? We don't even question that. And one of the things I really value about, value about economics, especially given that you, you're the triple threat, you have the entrepreneurial background as well, is that economics is one of those things that can help us see the role of entrepreneurship in producing yeah. social change and solving a lot of the problems in our communities that politics can often make worse. I, I love to hear some of your thoughts on 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 that side of things. How how can how can an economically informed understanding of entrepreneurship put us in a position to take greater ownership for rebuilding our own communities? and creating prosperity without waiting on some political savior to come along and rescue us. Right. And that, that goes back to you guys, the revolution of one. You know, if we start looking at it from that standpoint, you know, that I can come out here and be just as effective in my community. You know, uh, the people that own the mom and pop stores. And that's the thing. You're, you're finding a way to produce and get what you need on your own. Therefore, you won't have those political influences to make you vote or do something in a certain way. And I think, you know, and way back, that's the reason why, if we never knew why preachers became so established as the leaders of the political parties back in the day, because the church was the one who funded their salary and they didn't have to worry about whatever they said if they worked at the plant. Mr. Willie saying, hey, if you keep on talking like that to your people, I'm going to fire you. Fire you. So the, that's why preachers became the dominant spokesperson for people in our community, because it was our church that funded them. 
So imagine if the entrepreneurs that we have in our, you know, in our community would come and really be the spokespeople for what were the needs because they are not controlled because they have found a way to create their own revenue. Therefore, they can speak freely to what's really going on. And we really use that and didn't use people that's going to puppeteer some of the people in our community and say, hey, but that's, but you know, think about it. That's kind of what happens, TK, because you have a lot of these entrepreneurs, a lot of these entertainers, a lot of these football players that say, hey, we, uh, uh, you know, I am this big conglomerate and I own you. And if you start talking like that, I'm going to pull my advertising from, from you. And that's what happened. And then you get false spokesperson or spokespeople for our community that don't have what's right or what we need. And the best of mind, they're looking at what might be taken from us. And that's what happens. So if we are entrepreneurs, just think about this, man. Some of the mega churches, some of the entrepreneurs we have in Atlanta, we literally could literally build our own infrastructure of economics in this city. This is one of the only cities that you literally could build your own infrastructure just based on entrepreneurs, the mega churches and what we're doing here. But we don't do that. You know, and that's the question I always have. Why don't we do that? And, and in some ways, I think we're kind of conditioned to think in the opposite direction, right? Like the the more we think of progress at some as something that comes from uh, what I forget the uh, I think it was Stephen Davies maybe who called it the 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 myth of the great man, right? Like like so the the, the more we think in terms of progress as like. Who, who will be the next great man that will come along right. and lead us to the promised land? Who will be our Moses figure? Then the more we're kind of inclined to wait and, and to think about our power only in terms of like, hey, let's have these debates about who we should vote for so that we can you know, take advantage of this rare opportunity that comes up every once in a while to get somebody in office that's gonna move the needle. And meanwhile, like you said, we can vote in the marketplace 365 days of the year. We can vote with our dollars. We can vote with our mobility. We can vote with our creativity. And if, and if we just shift our, our, our sense of power away from the, the, the great man or the great figure right. that's going to save us and say, well, wait a minute, we can, we can do this ourselves. If we, if we come together, we can change the game ourselves without asking anybody for permission. I mean, you know, that's, that's powerful, but, but it starts with education, you know. I actually want to go video. back. Quote Sorry, that we mentioned. Um, the quote that you brought up, Coach, I, I wanted to bring that back up because, you know, we talked about this and, and I really enjoy the perspective that you had. And, and it was liberating. It, it, it was it was a liberating as, you know, as just my individual self. Like, what can I do? How can I revolutionize my life? And again, it, it goes back to this quote. Every man has his own courage and is betrayed because he seeks in himself the courage of other persons. And, and instead of looking inside and, and, and allowing us um, to be the change that we want to see, we, we, we look for that. We, we, you know, we're expecting and we're relying on it. Um, I, I think that's kind of what TK was saying in an extent. And so go ahead, coach. I know I cut you off. No, 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 man. You know, I love to hear that. My thing is to inspire others. Uh, when I start thinking about the great man theory, when do great men like get in trouble to a certain degree with this country? You know, when you start thinking about particularly Malcolm and Martin, they get in trouble when they start seeing that it's bigger than them and they attempt to try to organize. That's the one thing that if you're, you know, if you look like me and you in this country and you start attempting to organize, you know, that's when they started calling King a communist. You know, it, King could have kept marching, and I don't know this, this is just my thought on it. He could have kept marching forever, but when he went to Memphis and he started to organize those people down there and he started to or organize with the, the, the unions as far as equal pay for those trash collectors and everything, that's when he got in trouble. That's when the country really felt like he was a threat. You know, same thing with Malcolm, when he kind of split and he started saying, hey, let's have, let's organize this thing with other people so we can get like-minded people to start thinking and putting stuff in place. And that's the thing that I see with us all the time. We do it a lot individually, 
but we don't and i think that's where we want that great man to come in because we will individually do it but we won't do it as far as let me call him let me call him let me get this community let me get this board i've said for years bro you know like with the academy awards and stuff why do we you know and i know this is all but why do we have to have acceptance from somebody else on if we did a great job how can we can't come together and organize our own deal with that you know i've said with with hbcus you know with football and sports and stuff if we really want to if we really want to see five star and four star kids go to hbcus and play basketball and play football hbcus need to detach from the ncaa and run their own thing and therefore if they run their own thing they can get funding from all these companies, because right now it's not a company in America that wouldn't give money to a HBCU in this climate that we're in right now, and get those and get that money and start paying some players. You know, pay the players because they're getting, I almost said pimp, but you know they're getting used anyway. You know what I'm saying? So pay those players, get you some five and four star, and when they get the five and four star kids over there to the HBCUs, they'll get the television rights, get you about a 25 year contract on that, and get paid that way. So we're not organizing, man. And that's the big thing. That's what I love about what's happening now in this climate with the Pac-12 and all those different uh, kids that's out there. They are organizing and telling the NCAA, this is what we want as a group. And when you organize, people have to listen to you. You're not the lone gunman now that's crazy. There's other people that are like mine with you that think the same thing. And that's the only way our community is going to ever pull itself out of this situation is the organization and i like you know some of the things that's been happening but that organization we have to continue to organize continue to organize and come together as a community and say what are the things that we want and stop yelling out foolish stuff and really yell out and put on paper some things that's going to benefit us as a group i really wish we had an extra hour to just talk about college athletes and, and and getting paid because because just organizing in that way alone and, and, and creating our own voluntary alternatives to where we can situate things the way we want would be huge and game changing in terms of causing more financial resources to flow to and through our communities. I mean, I, I think that's a really interesting topic and, and I know we, we've seen some things happening in the past uh, couple of months, some interesting things with HBCU football and so forth. Man, I wish we had time to get into that because that's we, we may have to have to do a round too, uh, if possible. But we're at the hour right now. Uh, I'm glad we were able to just get get so much good conversation from you, Coach. Uh, I'm really I'm really excited that you. Uh, I'm really happy that you join us, and I'm really excited about other people uh, listening to this. So thanks so much, man. Thanks so much for sharing your your economic and entrepreneurial insights. Hey, thanks. And the real big guy in this is Kamal. Uh, I watched this young man grow. You know, he's he's going to do some great things. He's not finished. And that's the mark of being a great leader. So I'm expecting Kamal to reach back. And, you know, if you ran 200 yards with a Kamal, make sure that the next guy runs 400. Make sure that that next guy runs longer than that. And that's how we're going to change the narrative on the way this country looks at black men. It takes guys like what you and TK are doing, and I appreciate the opportunity and look forward to coming back on, man, because, you know, I can talk, dude. I'm from Mississippi. I can talk. <laughs> hey, my mama from Mississippi, so I think that's where I got it from on my end. <laughs> Before we cut it, I wanted to give you an opportunity, Coach, to, to, to tell people where they can follow you, to tell people where uh, they can find your business and, and all the workings that you do. Cool. Uh, the great thing about what we do, we are a delivery business. So it's Fat Daddy Smoking Barbecue. Uh, you can look that up on fat, uh, Facebook. Uh, my, I'll send him out a website that he can attach to this. You know, but it's Fat Daddy Smoking Barbecue. We cater. We do a great job. It's cooked to order. So it's like building a custom house. I just don't make a hundred different uh, hamburgers and say choose one. I cook exactly what you want. So that is the difference in what we do at Fat Daddy Smoking Barbecue. And we deliver, you know, so once you get your meal, we come to your house, 
you know, contactless delivery. We have great delivery guys that wear the shirts to do everything because I'm big on customer service. And we got it rolling, man. So look up Fat Daddy's Smoking Barbecue. I will send them out a link for the website. And we look forward to serving you with customer care and consistency. That's our hallmarks. That's good stuff. Appreciate it, brother. Thank you, Coach. For, for everybody else, remember every Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, unless I say otherwise, we're here live at 12 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. On Tuesdays and Thursdays, we have TK's Two Cents, where I take two tweets from the week, and I give a couple of thoughts on how to apply those tweets to your life to create more freedom. And then on Wednesdays, Kamau and I are here live having conversations with special guests about what's going on in the world and how to make big ideas accessible and practical in everyday experience. All right, everybody, I'll see you all tomorrow, 12 p.m. Eastern time. Peace. You guys have a great one.